welcome to the Ideas42 Academy seminar series. My name is Mitra Salosel, and I'm the Director of Communications at Ideas42. And on behalf of all of us on the team, thank you for tuning in to learn more about applying behavioral science to tough social problems. Today, we are joined by one of our academic affiliates, Dr. Renee Goslin, to discuss the like-minded algorithm, human AI integration, and considerations for decision-making. Renee is a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management and principal research scientist at MIT's initiative on the digital economy, where she heads its new research pillar on human-centered AI. Her research is at the intersection of behavioral science and technology, with a focus on how AI affects cognitive bias along the human decision-making journey. She's written a book called The Human Algorithm, which examines how AI impacts our lives and the benefits and perils of our digitally mediated judgments. Today, she'll be giving us a look at some of her research exploring the factors affecting people's relative preferences for algorithmic versus human input when seeking advice. Before I hand it off to Dr. Goslin, a small logistical matter. For those of you who are just joining us for the first time um, in our seminar series, we take questions through the Zoom Q&A box at the end of the presentation. Um, so as you have questions, please drop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll answer them live all at once at the end of the presentation. However, we will be taking clarifying questions throughout the presentation. So if there is something you have specifically about uh, a piece of the presentation, please don't hesitate to drop them into the Q&A box as they happen and we'll answer them at the appropriate time. All right, without further ado, Renee, over to you. Thank you, Mitra. Thank you, everybody. So happy you could join me, especially now in this time where you may be a bit zoomed out and may have not slept very well for five days recently. Um, but I hope you did get some sleep over the weekend and are revived because we'll need it. Um, and I'm happy to share some research with you today. Uh, I'll share with you some projects that are uh, some completed, some in process, and we'll have a nice chat. I'll be asking some questions of the audience, so I'll direct you to the chat when it comes time. So let me just share my screen, and hopefully you all see this. Right, so um, as Mitra mentioned, I am heading a new pillar at MIT's initiative on the digital economy that looks really deeply at human AI interaction. And we're looking at this because it's really the way that the world is going. The world has changed in so many ways. I mean, even just in our time living with COVID, right? We can see how technology has come to mediate the way in which we interact with loved ones, the way in which we access education, we work, we are able to nourish ourselves. And so when we think about this and we think about the role that technology and in particular algorithms, right? And artificial intelligence plays in our lives. Now's the time where we need to be really paying close attention to this because in many ways the train has left the station and we need to be thinking very thoughtfully about the implications then of this. So turns out according to McKinsey, worldwide uh, spending on AI is meant to double by 2024 to $110 billion annually. This is a tremendous amount of investment that's already un, uh, happened and will continue. And so the questions I tend to ask and what we're gonna be asking at this pillar, this research pillar is what are the implications then for the human part of the equation? Many people think about and talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, bias as it relates to the algorithms. Is the algorithm biased? And that is a tremendously important question to ask. But we also need to ask on the human side, what human biases there are and how these biases interact with algorithmic biases. And what does that mean for the likelihood that humans will even use the technology that is developed and what the implications are for their welfare. So this will be then the home for a variety of research projects. And I encourage you to reach out to me. My Twitter handle is at the bottom there. My DMs are open. Um, if you wanna talk with us about projects that examine um, some of the items listed here, which are not exhaustive, right? But human trust and how to develop cooperation and mutual learning and this interplay, as I mentioned, between biases that are both human and artificially intelligent and the symbiosis uh, associated there. And so today what I'll do is I'll share with you some of the projects that kind of fit in with that. Um, it'll be an amuse-bouche, if you will, 
where I'm going to start off talking about a paper that's in preparation that I'm doing with, um, that I have with a doctoral student, Heather Yang at MIT, who's on the job market um, and is brilliant. And in that paper, we look at cognitive style and how that affects advice seeking, particularly uh, with regard to AI. And then another project where we look at homophily, which I'll explain a little bit later on, but like mindedness um, and how that affects algorithm algorithmic use in uh, the era of COVID. And then last but not least, if we have time, I'll give you a sense of what's coming down the pike. Some research that I'm doing with Dave Rand and Zivi Epstein, um, Dave being a faculty member at MIT, Zivi being a doctoral student, where we look at AI and moral licensing and where we lay responsibility for biased outcomes when AI is involved. So let me start here. Um, so this is a picture of my son, my newborn son and me. And I start here because you may be wondering why am I looking at this topic? I mean, I've already motivated it with uh, all the money that's flying around, but that's not enough for why we should pursue these research uh, topics, is it? For me, this topic became pr particularly salient during my um, days as a, a new mom, right? And so you may look at this photo and you might think, oh, this is uh, bliss. This is really a moment of tranquility. And you know, in some ways it is. Um, I was snapped by a friend when I was dozing uh, and catching a, a snooze with my son on my chest. But what's really going on here is physical exhaustion um, where I just hadn't really slept uh, much because my son didn't take to sleeping very well still hasn't. Um, cognitive load for a working mom, and I'm sure all working parents and aunties and grandmas and uncles who are working from home and also have children running around can relate. Um, and yet at the same time, this desire for accuracy, right? Being a first time mom, I wanted to get it right. And there were so many sources for how to be a good parent and how not to mess your child up, which is of course the goal. Um, and I was really sort of overloaded and exhausted. And what I found at this time, which was my most, most vulnerable, I actually became far more likely to completely outsource cognitive uh, tasks to algorithms and to technology um, whenever I could. So whether it be driving someplace, whether it be doing simple math, I was so spent that even though I study for a living how all of these things affect human beings, I pretty much was ready to say, take the lead technology. And so this motivated the research for me because it made me think about how at my most vulnerable, I started to increasingly outsource my mind in this way. And what that means for the most vulnerable in our society and what that means also as we start to do this less consciously and more frequently. So I wanna ask you a little question um, and I'll ask you to go to the chat and give me your response. So this was a situation I was presented with. Uh, I went back to work and uh, driving to MIT uh, or rather driving home from MIT, I was faced with this choice. So this is actually a screen capture from Waze, the GPS app. And as you can see here, I have three different options to get home. Yes, rush hour in Boston is brutal. As you can see, they're all over one hour. Um, but you can also see that these are pretty much the same, right? One hour, 11 minutes, two of those, and one 17. Um, but there are some differences with respect to, to what that journey would be like. And so I ask you, what would you choose? If you wouldn't mind, go to the, Q, uh, go to the chat box and uh, let me know what, what, you might, what you might choose. What would your preference be? So Jeff says the first one, okay. Maria says the first one, Allie, Bradley. Wow, there's a convergence around the first one. Everyone says the first one, <laughs> 31 miles. Um, someone says the third, I hate traffic highway drive. Second is less mileage, yes, uh, says Zazandre. Hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. Jessica says second. Right. So some folks at first, some uh, most say first, some say second. We've got at least one person who's going to go for the third. Cool. Now, there was no right or wrong answer for this, by the way. So whatever you answered is just fine. 
But I share this with you because um, the average American makes about 35,000 choices, right? And many of these feature goal conflict. And what you can see here is this very thing, right? So you want to get home as quickly as possible, but you also might have to pay a toll. So there are some economic constraints. Then there's also the issue of what kind of experience you want. Do you want one where you're sitting in traffic for 42 minutes? Or do you want one where you have sort of intermittent motion and, and then some stopping and, and so on? Do you want to avoid the police if they're on the route? And all of this goes into your decisions when you make choices with AI, right? Now, when you look at this, for me, it makes me think of being in the vehicle with my husband and how we have very different orientations toward AI. When the GPS tells me, here's the route to take, once I've chosen the route, I adhere to it pretty faithfully. My husband, on the other hand, uh, attempts to try to beat the algorithm and uh, somehow get there faster despite having cho chosen the route. I use this example to say that we all have individual level preferences and orientations toward artificial intelligence. And that is exactly what I'm going to be talking about today, how these dispositions or how these orientations affect the likelihood of trusting, using AI, applying it, and being skeptical of it or following it faithfully. And that whole phenomenon is something that I'm particularly interested in. So when we ask on any, on any given day, how often do you incorporate algorithms into your decisions, or if we became more quantitative about it, what proportion um, of human versus AI input factors into your decisions? These are the kinds of questions that I'm asking. And for myself, I don't know the answer. And that's a little bit scary for me because it's become so non-conscious. But our perceptions of AI, whether accurate or not, affect the answer to this question. Okay, so can tech intervention help us make better decisions? Are these algorithms helping us make better choices? Now, they can be helpful, of course, when you think about nudges like here, you see in the Waze screen capture. Waze incorporated this pop-up at the point of destination because, as I mentioned before, new parents are pretty exhausted. Babies tend to sleep a lot too, especially in moving vehicles. And in order to combat incidents where um, sleeping children were left in vehicles by exhausted parents, Waze has this option whereby you can have a pop-up at your destination that says, don't forget the kid, you idiot, or you can modify it to say whatever it is you want to say. So in this case, right, an algorithm can be super helpful, like in the case of a nudge. But of course, there can be harm, tremendous harm that we need to pay close attention to. Um, if you haven't already, I highly recommend reading Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Math Destruction. She's brilliant. And she talks about how algorithmic bias as employed by people in positions of power, for instance, those who decide who gets a loan or who gets insurance, um, when those decisions are reliant upon biased algorithms, they serve to not only reflect inequality in society, but actually to augment, to replicate it, and to amplify it. So certainly they can be harmful. But other research that I've been involved in says it can depend. And it depends on the mindset you have when you're using the algorithm. So for instance, in a paper that came out recently, my co-authors and I look at people who are using digital products and algorithms to learn. And they are using these products in a variety of settings, trying to uh, increase mental acuity, trying to improve their knowledge of finance, um, trying to improve engineering, trying to learn a new language. And across all of these settings, what we find is that there may be reverse placebo effects or forward placebo effects. And those effects, really are determined by the mindset you have when you're using the technical product. So if you view it as a tool that serves you, you're more likely to get the benefit out of it because you say, hey, this is just something that's in my repertoire, it's in my toolkit, not unlike a calculator, and I'm in control, and you receive benefits, forward placebo effects, if you will. But 
To the extent that you view AI as being superior in its intelligence, as you're being limited and these technological products as being masters of these domains, particularly when they're associated with higher or premium brands, right? So companies that are well-regarded and that are considered leaders in their fields. When AI is applied here, and it is viewed as something that is not a tool, but rather something that supplements your weakness or your inferiority, then actually we see reverse placebo effects, right? Where people's performance actually suffers. Even though in these experiments, the only thing we changed was the name of the company on the label of the digital product. So we see that there are all these different outcomes. It's an, you know, classic academic research, it depends. Um, and so for me, I think about this because there's this false dichotomy that seems to characterize a lot of conversation, man versus machine, human versus AI. But in fact, the reality is that the integration of human and AI intelligence is more representative of our realities every day. Increasingly, as digital transformation accelerates um, as companies like Microsoft has, have said that they experienced more digital transformation in the first two months of the pandemic than they had in two years. And so when we think about how people make decisions, right, in addition to moving from a traditional utility rational, utility maximizing rational actor, homo economicus, we also need to think about moving toward a homo technologicus. Um, the human that outsources a lot of choice, a lot of cognitive load to uh, an artificially intelligent uh, being or platform or machine learning uh, tool and how that affects the way in which we think in this interplay. And that's something I talk about in my forthcoming book uh, on M coming out on MIT Press, but not out yet. Okay, so some examples of these interventions and how this sort of is becoming more and more prevalent in all of facets of our lives. Um, an example here, if you live in the New England area, in the Boston area, you might be familiar with Jordan's Furniture. So you might think when I'm buying a mattress, I'll lie on it. If I like it, I'll get it. If I don't, I won't. But in fact, even in the mattress game, right? Now we have AI um, and Jordan's Furniture has Bridge It, which through some kind of black box uh, process can figure out what mattress suits you best um, by using data and um, you know, improve your sleep. Another example here recently from the MIT uh, Lincoln Laboratory, right? If you're stressed on the job, the artificially intelligent teammate, speaking of integration, will be able to say, hang on now, it seems like you're pretty tired or you're pretty cognitively overloaded. So let me step in here and let me help. So assessing when you're experiencing fatigue and the artificially intelligent teammate will know when to sort of uh, take over and give you a cognitive break. And in the field of finance, which is one of the settings we use for our research, uh, you're trying to manage your financial uh, portfolio, for example, and you can make choices between having an algorithm or a robo advisor uh, lead you or a human being who is a financial advisor and can give you some feedback um, according to your goals. And all of these things are real, right? And so what we did with this first uh, research project that I'm sharing with you with this paper that I've done with Heather Yang is we look at this pretty specifically, uh, particularly as it relates to the last, um, last question. We didn't look at uh, mattresses or AI teammates. But given that humans are biased, right? Are they biased about algorithms? And how does that affect their decisions or behaviors? And do these individual level cognitive style uh, differences lead to acceptance or avoidance of algorithmic input? And what might explain it? So I'm not going to keep you in suspense. Uh, turns out that humans are biased about algorithms. And turns out that intuitive thinkers are particularly biased against them. So I know you, we have a lot of behavioral scientists on the call, and I'm not sure, maybe some folks are more steeply, you know, steeped in that and less. So I'll just give you an example so that it grounds what we mean by cognitive style. 
So imagine you're driving on a dark road like this in a wooded area and out pops this creature, this animal, the deer. What do you do? Now, we don't need uh, any kind of uh, education to know that you mash the brakes. You try and stop immediately. In fact, it's quite automatic, uh, almost like muscle memory in some ways. Um, and that even though I'm sure we have a very brilliant person on the call who would say, well, I would assess, you know, the, the acceleration of the vehicle, the density of the deer, and, you know, uh, what is the barometer, most people would probably just mash the brakes. Now, let's contrast that, right, with a question about, imagine we all could go out, um, and Morgan says you're supposed to accelerate so that you flip the deer. I don't know if I want to go driving with you, Morgan, but um, okay. <laughs> Imagine that we're all going out for an event um, and we're not in quarantine. That would be a lovely day. And you're asked to select a wine for the table, right? Now, how would you decide what wine to choose? You might take into account um, your past experiences and say, oh, I, I, re I really like this varietal um, or I like wines from this particular region, right? or terroir. You might seek further information by asking a wait staff member or a sommelier about this. You might ask people at the table what their preferences are. You may try to match according to the meal you're planning on eating. Or you might think about you know, social signaling and think, well, if I order anything that's too cheap, that doesn't reflect positively on me. But if I order something that, you know, a magnum of Dom Perignon, that probably also wouldn't reflect positively on me either. Nevertheless, you're taking into account a variety of things as you're weighing your options, right? And that then is a far more deliberative um, cognitive experience. So you're familiar with this if you're thinking, if you're familiar with system one and thinking fast and system two and thinking slow. And of course, Daniel Kahneman's book and the book uh, and the work of others who've looked at this. And I'm not here to knock, right, those systems, of course. Um, the use of heuristics and shortcuts is obviously super important because we can mash our brakes quickly at the sight of the deer. But of course, we need to be mindful of these heuristics. So even though it's lovely that you could read this sentence, even though I've intentionally put three typos in it, because you can automatically descramble the words, uh, depending upon your, your familiarity with the English language, um, we still need to be careful, and particularly as it relates to AI, we really don't know much at all about how these kinds of cognitive styles affect the likelihood that we'll trust or employ an AI, which is really important as we talked about further or earlier. So um, when we ask about this, we employ the use of um, uh, understanding cognitive style system one or system two reliance, um, understanding that system two reliant people are likely to be more intuitive or place much faith in their intuition. Um, and so we employ the cognitive reflection test with which you might be familiar. Um, and that measures how cognitively reflective you are. So whether you're more lazy or effortful in your processing. So just to review for those who may not be familiar with the details of this, um, it's such a robust test that it's kind of boiled down to three questions even. Um, a bat and a ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost, right? And another question about machines and making widgets and how long it would take to make 100 machines, uh, for 100 machines to make 100 widgets. And then the classic um, lily pad question, doubling in size um, and how long it would take for the lily pads to cover half of the lake. Now, um, the performance on this has been predictive of a variety of things, right? Including one's propensity to believe in fake news, for example, research by Penny Cook and Rand has identified that. Also other behaviors like reward deferment and self-control. And these are important, right? Because these behaviors, uh, particularly the reward deferment and the self-control are associated with what we believe to be markers of success in our social success, right? The ability to sort of focus on education now and worry about fun and play later, although ideally they would be you know, simultaneous. Or um, deferring, you know, a, a, a hedonistic purchase in the short term for saving your money. Uh, similarly with health, um, you know, controlling your desire to have the chocolate cake and having a piece of fruit instead. And so when we think about this, um, we took this as a means of measuring cognitive style at, in our studies. By the way, if you're wondering what the answers are, 
there they are at the bottom. Um, and I'm sure uh, you got them right, uh, particularly if you had more time. Okay, so who's more likely to embrace uh, AI advice in a customer experience, for instance, if you're a patient or if you are a decision maker? In general, people prefer human advisors at the moment. Um, 60 plus percent of people prefer to deal with a human over a bot, um, although that may change as we become more accustomed to having uh, bots. And certainly it's changed because we have more interaction with this oftentimes than we do with people in our lives. So we don't necessarily view that as stable statistic. But indeed, um, there's much to be learned about how and when we trust uh, AI. So past research, for instance, has shown that people display algorithmic aversion, right? They prefer the human over the AI when stakes are high and you need someone to blame. And so, for example, when you're trying to make a decision about whether or not you should have an operation, and in these uh, studies, when people were presented with the option to uh, take on advice from what a human doctor suggests versus an algorithmic medical advisor, people preferred the human, all things being held equal. And the idea behind that is, you know, you can't really get upset at a bot. I mean, I guess you could, but it wouldn't be particularly satisfying in terms of a reaction. But when it comes to a human, then you can actually, if there's a negative outcome, go to that human and say, you told me to do this and uh, I blame you for the outcome. Now, other research has looked at algorithmic appreciation and when that's to happen. And in this research, people were given a task where they looked at this gentleman uh, pictured here and they were asked to estimate the gentleman's weight. Now, when that estimate is discrete and there's a correct answer, right? People tend to prefer an algorithmic's input. So they make an estimate and they're less likely to adjust away when a human or crowdsource uh, advice uh, source comes in versus when there is an algorithmic source. And then for our research, we look at this with reflective thinkers. So this is different, right? Because Others have looked at features of the algorithm. So is it humanoid? Others have looked at features of the task. Is it quantitative? But we're looking at features of the decision maker, of the human. And what we find is that reflective thinkers, right, um, are less likely, are more likely, excuse me, to embrace algorithmic input. So when you're less impulsive, this is what happens. And we looked at this in a variety of settings. Um, your investment behaviors, uh, hiring someone, um, admitting someone to college, making uh, healthcare related decisions. And I'm gonna share a little bit with you today. So this is actually the financial setting. And so what we do is we have people uh, complete the cognitive reflection test test, we ask them a host of questions, and then we present them with a scenario. And in this scenario here, you're making an investment decision on your portfolio of assets, and you have a wide range of uh, assets, and you're looking for advice, and you can get this advice from a human or a financial advisor. Now, importantly here, you're not being forced to choose one or the other. And that's like that's that's more re uh, representative of what things are like in the real world. But we're asking you to make decisions and we're seeing the degree to which you have a proportional preference for human versus um, an artificially intelligent source. And essentially what we find is that across all of these scenarios, right, your score on that cognitive reflection test or what kind of thinker you are, system one or system two, is predictive of what kind of advisor you will express a preference for. And that's even controlling for a variety of, of factors within the model. So whether or not you are uh, very experienced with AI or comfort with technology, um, whether you have anxiety in dealing with people or social anxiety, the big five personality uh, measures here, agreeableness, conscientiousness, extroversion, neuroticism, and openness, um, domain spe specific expertise, um, and how well you, you think you did on the test or how intelligent you, you think you are, right? So despite all of these things, what you see is this interesting kind of linear path where as you're going from 
uh, less cognitively reflective to more cognitively reflected as measured by the numbers of uh, correct answers as you see here on the bar, you become more and more preferential toward algorithmic advice than you do from human advice. Um, so as I mentioned, um, these alternative explanations that we measured don't really explain why we see this um, outcome, but we do have an important mediator in terms of perceptions of accuracy. And it turns out that cognitive style um, and its relationship to which advisor you choose uh, is, is mediated by your perceptions of the accuracy and that system two thinkers or more deliberative thinkers have a cognitive bias where they believe that algorithms are more accurate than human beings, right? And so as a result of this, they, they display this uh, algorithmic um, appreciation. Now I'll talk about what that could mean for future studies, um, but this relationship is robust to a variety of settings. And so um, we, we think about what this means for people who are deliberative thinkers, especially if they're the types of people who are in positions of power or influence, and how that cognitive bias around accuracy affects the decisions that they make and affects the people who um, are on the receiving end of their decisions. Renee, we do have a, a clarifying question, actually, yeah. sorry to interrupt, uh, no from Piyush. Um, could people's reflectiveness change with context? For example, if they're more cognitively taxed, they become impulsive? Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Piyush. Yes, so yes, people who are system two dominant can start to look like system one when you cognitively task them, when you distract them, when you exhaust them. Um, I will admit I was in system one mode when I was there exhausted with my baby. Um, it is, however, far more difficult to make a system one dominant person look more like a system two. And we've tried, many have tried. Um, but there is um, an opportunity for nudging, right, to interrupt some of this automatic thinking that will um, you know, encourage more deliberative behavior, but it's very, it's far easier to make a system two person, um, you know, taxed than it is to get a system one person to mimic or behave like a system two person. So thanks for the question. So we did this study um, and we had these findings and then we entered a, um, a COVID-19 world. Before I get into that, I see a question from Cam here. Um, would the finance example be considered kind of a discrete answer situation where people more appreciate algorithms? Or is there a difference between quantitative and discrete here? Yeah, so that's a great question, Cam. So there's a difference between quantitative and discrete here, right? So discrete, well, the way I talk about it before is there's a right or wrong answer. What is this man's weight in the photo, right? There is an answer um, and you don't know it and you could get it right. Um, whereas for financial management, sure, it may be quantitative, but there's no sort of objectively right answer in terms of, you know, ultimately the benefit to you is can be achieved in multiple ways, right? And how you feel, and you know, whether you feel that you've experienced benefit can be subjective as well. Mind you, we also looked at this with other cases like, you know, uh, hiring people, college admissions, and healthcare. Um, and so you could imagine that the right candidate, there's more than one candidate who could do, you know, perform well in a position. Um, and your sort of uh, task there is not discrete in the way that what is the correct answer here type of question is discrete. Thanks for the question. So then we entered a COVID-19 world and digital transformation accelerating everything and creating many sources of advice. What should I do? Do I have it? Should I get tested? And there being many sources of both human and algorithmic bias uh, or advice, <laughs> some, of bi some of them being biased, some um, better than others. And so what do you do if you're thinking about this? Well, from an AI perspective, the response was a flurry of machine learning uh, you know, tools to try to help understand who's more likely to get it, um, where it's going to crop up next, um, and how, of course, we could combat uh, the virus. So this seemed ripe for this kind of research because it's like, well, what do I do? And 
we see here at this particular touch point, an initial decision to seek diagnosis, there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, so as you know, there were many more people who wanted to know their status than there were tests. Tests were difficult to obtain. Um, and so you had a lot of companies deciding to meet the moment by offering uh, algorithmic ways of kind of pre-screening whether or not you should go in and demand a test. So Google offered its COVID-19 screener, so did Apple, and a variety of telehealth companies did as well. Where what you do here is you provide, you know, your information about your symptoms, your behavior, things of that nature, and you would get advice as to whether or not you might be likely to have been exposed and what to do next. So the question becomes, what do we choose at this decision touch point? Do we decide to use one of these algorithmic tools to uh, reduce the uncertainty and of course the risk, especially during this time of panic? Um, or do we insist that we see a human pre-screener? Um, and again, not a physician, but a pre-screener. Now, this is important because within the healthcare realm, AI is really taken off. You see here that doctors in Germany are allowed to prescribe apps, right, as part of a healthcare regimen, prescribe apps as if they are medicine. And even recently, you see research that showed that 64 Black patients lost a chance at a kidney transplant because of an algorithm that was biased and treated Black patients differently than white patients. In fact, the GFR, the glomular filt filtration rate of a kidney that shows the degree to which the kidney is working has a completely different threshold for black patients than it does for white patients based on biases that of course predate AI, but then are baked into these models where in this case tragically uh, led to 64 patients losing the chance at transplant. So we decided to look into, into this and looking at you know, what the human's algorithm is for weighing artificial or uh, algorithmic input. Now, sociologists, if we can sort of ground this in some literature, identify homophily as being an important factor in advice seeking and advice acceptance. Now, traditionally, this is done with respect to homophily between actors within a social network. Simply put, if you think someone thinks like you, you're more likely to befriend them and you're more likely to seek advice from them come the time for uh, a decision, right? So that homophily or that similarity then um, fosters connectedness, but importantly for this research, advice seeking behavior. So the question becomes, do we have latent biases or a latent theory about similarity or dissimilarity of human cognitive styles uh, to artificially intelligent cognitive styles? Would we prefer, if we are system one, a similarly intuitive decision-making approach, or would we prefer something that's complementary? Are we looking at, given our expectations about human or our assumptions about human cognitive style, a like-minded advisor? Or are we looking for our complement? So in this research, we decide to look at this with respect to COVID. And so once again, we ask using the cognitive reflection test, um, a variety of questions, and then we present them a scenario. And in the scenario, similar to what I showed you actually exists, these users had the option of getting the pre-screen from a human, not a physician, but a human or an artificially intelligent bot. Equally knowledgeable, neither of whom is a physician, simply a pre-screen that would determine whether or not, help them determine whether or not they want to seek the test. Now, what we find is that AI generally people believe is more deliberative, right? And people generally believe that humans are more intuitive. That's probably not surprising. But that belief is stronger amongst low CRT people. Additionally, when asked to make self-assessments um, as to whether ten they tend to be kind of intuitive or an analytic uh, you know, thinker, low CRT people have a bias in regards to their self-assessment in that they think that they're more reflective than they are. Um, but high CRT people are less optimistic in this way. Additionally, um, 
what we find is that high CRT people are more algorithmically appreciative of AI for assessing their COVID-19 risk, right? So AI is perceived as both more accurate and more homophilous in its cognitive style. Simply put, system two or more deliberative thinkers believe that they're more deliberative, believe that AI is more deliberative and seek homophily in their decision-making. So when we think about this, these results don't suggest a complementary decision-making strategy. I'm a system one person, so I should be more AI appreciative, quite the opposite. In fact, like-minded advice is taken, which actually reflects what the literature and sociology talks about with regard to homophily. And um, low CRT scores are stronger in their belief that humans are superior intuitively, um, which might explain their algorithmic aversion. Um, we tested the same alternative uh, you know, explanations um, and we find that those do not explain um, this phenomena here. So in conclusion for this, we don't know in the real world whether high CRT people are more likely to adhere to stay at home orders or to be more adherent to CDC recommendations. But certainly the behavioral lens can help us understand how people make decisions and may provide us an opportunity to pursue nudge interventions where for instance, we could show information about AI's accuracy rate or how these models have performed. Or perhaps if we wanted to get people to pay more attention to other humans, show more social proof information. And that's what we're looking at. Um, that's what we're looking at now. Looking ahead, the third project that I mentioned that we're, that we're working on at this time is um, an idea that the algorithm made me do it. And I'm working on this with um, David and Zivi at MIT. And it really is in response to the idea, to the evidence um, that's mounting that people think that AI can combat human bias. So in hiring processes, you can see many companies, big influential companies use, for example, HireVue, right? To take the pool of applicants and whittle it down to a manageable size for human interviewers who would then use that subset to make a decision about offering the position. However, recent research coming out of MIT suggests that at least in the case of financial services firms, their hiring algorithms aren't necessarily helping and still have a bias toward traditional candidates, white males from prominent schools. And so in this research, what we're doing is we're looking at a variety of decision settings, uh, hiring, healthcare, and who gets care, um, uh, criminal justice settings. And we're trying to understand the degree to which people give an excuse or a pass to biases when they believe an algorithm was involved in the decision. That is, do we feel like because an algorithm is involved, the likelihood that human biases to blame is lower, there, thereby allowing people to say the algorithm made me do it and having a potentially negative second order effect by having human AI integration in this goal to combat bias. So stay tuned um, for the, those results because they're coming in uh, momentarily. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna close up now so that I can leave some time for Q&A. Um, but as we look at the road ahead for human AI integration, there are some really important questions we need to ask. First of all, assuming that harm is possible and not assuming that harm is the, outs, you know, the outlier or likely not to happen is going to be important. And thinking about how we can protect people, particularly those who are most vulnerable. When we think about algorithmic appreciation being more likely amongst system two thinkers and those that are more successful, um, it's important that we think about them as being just as prone to irrationality as those everyday Joes that we tend to talk about. And also asking the question first, should we be doing this? Should we have AI involved in hiring? Should we have AI involved in education? You may be familiar with the recent example in the UK when the schools had to shut down due to COVID, machine learning being applied there to use past performance, grades, tests, and the like to predict someone's 
test performance on a university admissions exam, and that prediction being used to determine who gained admission in the absence of the actual test. Should we be using AI to predict people's performance for such important life-altering decisions? I would argue no. And so we need to be thinking about in our zeal in building the better mousetrap in terms of better algorithms, should we be using a mousetrap here at all? And then taking a systemic view to think about second order effects. If we start to use AI to improve human decisions everywhere, could we potentially be creating a situation where human beings are left off the hook or be, are perceived as less accountable for the biases that result from these integrated decision-making processes? And then what is the right balance of AI and human input? And how does that vary for whom and when? Here we talk about cognitive style as being an important factor to think about, but certainly that's not the only one. And so we look forward to, to really exploring this space more. So I wanna thank you for joining me today and for your attention um, and for your questions and comments. I really appreciate it. And please do stay in touch. Um, I feel excited about being part of this community and all of the exciting research that is happening, but more importantly, having a positive effect on the world, which I think um, we certainly can given our positions as researchers. So I'm gonna stop the share and hand it back over to Ms. Mitra if you would like to uh, moderate the Q&A. Absolutely. Um, so now is the perfect time for everyone on the line to drop any questions you might have for Renee into the Q&A box. Uh, we don't have any at the moment, so we'll give people a couple of seconds. Um, and while we are awaiting uh, the furious question typing, um, I just want to remind everyone on the line that we have some upcoming academy programming on our website at ideas42.org slash academy. Um, our next crash course in behavioral science is actually starting on November 30th. If this piques some more questions uh, for those of you on the line who might want to apply the basics of uh, behavioral science in your own work, and you can learn more about our upcoming seminar series. Awesome. Well, as people are, you know, sort of mulling over the content, I realize, you know, it's a little bit of a fire hose there. Um, maybe I could ask you guys what you're thinking about. What are your sort of top priorities with respect to the, the rolling out of AI? Are there any examples that you've seen that are best practices or anything that uh, is cringeworthy um, in, your, in your mind with respect to our robot overlords? Uh, <laughs> gaining more ground, <laughs> um, certainly from a behavioral science perspective or really uh, in general. No chat yet. Perhaps I everyone answered all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I guess this field is done. We're, we've answered it all. <laughs> um, all right. So we have something, I think. Uh, thank you. <laughs> we do have a couple of questions. Um, I think we've, we've broken the ice here. Um, so this is a question from uh, Sanjeev. Do you know of any work connecting CRT and morality? Wow. That is a great question, Sanjeev. Um, I love that question. And I don't know if you're a researcher, but if you are, um, this is an area that I think is fruitful. Um, I am not aware offhand of any literature that really explains CRT and morality or you know, kind of has a model that we can follow. Um, but I think it's really provocative, right? Because particularly with relation to technology, because we're almost, as, we, as we're having AI be involved in hiring and admissions and in an effort to kind of combat human cognitive bias, it's almost like we're hoping that AI serves as our moral guards, right? As our, um, as our sentries for morality, because we don't 
believe that human beings can do it themselves because we are fallible, because we are uh, biased. So I really think that's a provocative question, especially for AI. Um, and it, it, it almost sort of evokes notion of like a Truman Show like, um, you know, godlike figure that's a bot that kind of has this sort of role to keep us uh, from our worst selves and to remind us of our better angels. But I don't have um, offhand an answer to that question that I can think of, but thank you Sanji for that. And we have another question this time from Ali um, who asks, have you seen any differences in trust with explicit AI uh, and implicit AI? Hmm. So I have not, we have not tested that, you know, specifically in the scope of this paper. Um, but that's a really good question. And um, I think it's open to empirical, to empirical study. Great. Um, and this is a question from Harrison. Is there any research or evidence around how people who process a lot of AI output change their decision-making over time? Hmm. I'm just reading an example of a judge. Interesting. Um, so I'm not aware of any longitudinal uh, types of studies that show an inflection point. One of the things we want to look at um, is this over time, right? So this kind of updating that happens as you make repeated decisions. Most of the research has looked at kind of an individual point or cross-sectional. Um, but I think that now that we're get, developing theory about this, the next step, right, is to look at how we can have interventions that can interrupt these biases, um, but also how we can see over time when people start to either um, say, okay, I've learned that I shouldn't trust AI or vice versa. And whether or not that sort of is most effective, maybe at the beginning point of a decision later, you could imagine in a purchase decision, right? Um, in a funnel uh, situation, uh, an AI intervention at the point where you're closer to the decision versus when you're at the beginning and you're searching um, can have a different effect as well. So um, no, there's not a, 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 an organizing theory around that in particular, but I think that that's, that's next up. Great. Um, here's a question from Mark that I think is all too relevant for all of us right now. Um, in such a remote setting, what do you think is the future, good or bad, of AI as a catalyst for social interactions and introductions in a time when meeting random people in person can pose a threat to one's health? I love that question, Mark. I love it. Um, so I think there are some tremendous benefits to be had. When we think about people who are isolated and lonely in general, for instance, the elderly, um, you could imagine having an AI assistant or companion could be life-saving, frankly, um, and could help stimulate cognitive, um, you know, uh, activity, and, and which we know is important for those who are experiencing cognitive decline. So I think there are tremendous options. I'm, I'm currently uh, co-chairing my college reunion. Um, yes, I, I didn't have enough to do, so I added that to the plate. And... Um, we're looking at this very question and I'm looking at it as you know a reunion planner, but I'm also looking at it as a researcher. And you may be familiar with some platforms at the moment that are trying to replicate that kind of organic um, human interaction. There's one called gather.town, right? And some conferences have used it where you can sort of bump into people and then a little Zoom sort of world will pop up. Um, but I think we need more of that, right? And I think we need, we need it to be done because there are those who could benefit tremendously uh, from it. However, we should not just deploy it without thinking critically about what the potential risks are and, and what the harm might be. Okay, got a question from Becca. Do you think experts, for example, doctors, would be more likely to use or not use AI compared to people with less experience on a given task? Huh. So that's a really good question. I think um, I think there may be reluctance on the part of some experts if the role of AI were to be positioned as being competing, right? Now we know that AI is being used to assess scans, radiology scans and things of that nature. And in some respects, AI performs better than human beings just in terms of like recognizing variations. Um, but the humans perform better than AI in many, many more uh, 
specific tasks, right? So I think what this means is we need to talk about it in an integrative way, not in man versus machine, either or way. And we need to be very clear about how AI can be in service of those physicians. Because as the research I talked about earlier in the paper, uh, in the talk, you know, suggests, um, when we talk about AI in a way that's like, it is more, it is superior to you. It is this sort of omniscient um, genius source. That's when we run into trouble in terms of how human performance, um, you know, is affected. So I like that question. And I think um, we should be collecting data on that if anybody <laughs> has access to physicians. Um, okay, to use the finance example that you went over earlier, um, this is from Daniela. Uh, what if algorithmic input was the only possible option for customers? Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations for creating the best experience for the users based on your research and findings? Um, in other words, how would you make system one and system two thinkers feel comfortable utilizing and trusting an algorithmic input? Yes, so Daniela, that's a great question. Um, I think about that a lot and I actually, so I teach a customer, a digital customer experience course and what you're alluding to is actually a CX type of question. And I look specifically at that to give you the shorthand answer, right? Um, it really uh, sort of speaks to the behavioral kind of data that we need to gather and understanding where people are more engaged to find the touch points at which they're most comfortable having further agency or outsourcing some decision making. And we have some models that we use in this course to talk about how important it is when you're using technology to talk about it in terms of the value that you're creating for the user, the patient, the customer, and which customers prefer which kinds of value. Now, it may be for system one people that they really get a lot of value about feeling customization, feeling like um, you know, they're getting a bit of a personal touch um, and feeling that they're getting value that is beyond just mere kind of frictionless or efficient experience, which people focus on now, but you know, is not all that, that people are looking for. So that's a great question. And um, you know, we could have a whole class on that. Great. Um, so there are a couple of questions left that are, um, I think, related to a discussion that we were just having. And unfortunately, we have come up to the end of time. Um, so if you have any lingering questions um, for Dr. Goslin, of course, please feel free to um, get in touch with her um, directly via uh, her Twitter handle, which is at Renee Goslin, um, or <clears throat> She has said that email is also an option and we will be following up. She just dropped into the chat. Thank you very much. Um, we recorded this session and we'll be following up with a recording of this session for all of you in the coming days. Um, and I want to thank um, Renee for her time and for sharing her insights and expertise on this topic with all of us and echo her thanks to all of you for your questions. Um, and we will see you at the next installment of the Ideas 42 Academy. Thanks, guys. Be safe.